August 1st, 1971, the moon. Two astronauts stand in the silhouette of Mons Hadley. One kneels, fumbling in his pocket with big clumsy gloves. Slowly, hearing his own breathing, he lays two objects in the soft lunar soil. The first is an aluminum figure, frozen mid-step. Behind it, he sinks a plaque. It contains the names of the 14 men who have died for this dream. It names the crew of Apollo 1, alongside five other NASA astronauts who perished before their chance to launch. It names Vladimir Komarov, who fell to Earth when his re-entry parachute failed. It names the crew of the Soyuz 11, the first to man a space station, asphyxiated when their return capsule depressurized. And it names Yuri Gagarin, the first man in space, killed in a freak training crash. The astronaut straightens. It's time to go. Apollo 15's mission is nearly over, and humanity will only land twice more on the moon. He gives the plaque a final look. It's the last time human eyes will see it, until we return. This final chapter of our History of Space Travel series is brought to you by the Space Ninjas at Digital Extremes, creators of my favorite free-to-play shooter, Warframe. Check out their most innovative expansion yet, Empyrean, at the link below, and stick around after the episode to learn how you can win $250,000 towards a real-life trip to outer space. Landing a crew on the moon was arguably the greatest technological achievement in human history. It was also probably the worst thing to ever happen to NASA. With the space race won and national prestige no longer on the line, the public quickly lost interest in further missions. Voices who had long objected to the expense of NASA's budget, money they argued could be better spent on social programs, grew louder. NASA soon found itself having to scale back and fight for funding, a process that became more difficult now that every project paled in comparison with the romance of Apollo. Over in the Soviet Union, things weren't much better. The Soviet's N-1 rocket was designed for exactly one goal, to beat Apollo. And with that mission a failure, Korolev's old rival, Glushko, finally got an opening to settle their score. He took over the N-1 project and destroyed it. Like, literally, actually destroyed it. He disassembled and scrapped the rockets, including two nearly ready for launch. He broke up the teams, seized their research, and burned the blueprints. This wasn't just petty rivalry, though. Having lost the space race to the moon, Soviet leaders wanted to bury evidence that they'd even tried to compete. And it wasn't until 1990 that the USSR even acknowledged the existence of a moon program. But space exploration didn't stagnate. In fact, it actually became better. Because with the pressure of the space race removed, programs became more focused on scientific discovery and perfecting orbital operations. NASA continued sending probes throughout the solar system and outside it. Meanwhile, in 1971, the Soviet Union launched the world's first space station, Salyut 1. After it succumbed to orbital decay, other Soviet stations followed. In 1973, the United States revealed its own troubled research station, Skylab. Damaged during launch, its first crew had to figure out how to repair the vessel in orbit. A frustrating experience, but one that proved the operation was possible. Then, in 1975, a hatch opened and everything changed. On one side, in the last Apollo craft to fly, floated an American astronaut. On the other, in a Soyuz model, was a Soviet cosmonaut. And somewhere over West Germany, they shook hands. A symbol of the thawing Cold War and the beginning of international cooperation in space. And it came just in time to save the Soviets' next project, the space station Mir. With its first module launching in 1986 and the last installed in 1996, Mir was the first station to be assembled in orbit. But the fall of the Soviet Union put the project in jeopardy. So with budget cuts hitting both NASA and the new Russian Federal Space Agency, the two decided to join forces. NASA's reusable space shuttles made runs to Mir, ferrying astronauts and cosmonauts of various nations. And by the time it deorbited in 2001, people from the UK, Japan, Syria, Bulgaria, France, Germany, Austria, Slovakia, and Canada had all worked on Mir. It had become, inadvertently, a testbed for the International Space Station which is helping us learn about what's needed to support human life during the long gulf between heavenly bodies. And make no mistake, that is the goal. Much like Gemini laid the technological groundwork and developed the knowledge needed for Apollo, our operations today are building towards supporting human travel and habitation in deep space. In fact, multiple countries, from China to Japan to the United States, are currently ramping up for the first step, a return to the moon.
This year, NASA accepted a presidential challenge to return to the moon by 2024. This time, though, the goal isn't just to land, but to stay there. And the linchpin of this plan is the Gateway, a space station that could stay crewed in lunar orbit and navigate itself over any part of the moon's surface. Gateway would provide a stepping stone for both lunar expeditions and eventual Mars missions, assisting with research, communications, and logistics for crewed bases. From there, lunar bases will explore the moon for clues about the solar system's development and experiment with extracting water from lunar ice. And the next step would be a 150-day manned mission to Mars in the 2030s. But I bet you're wondering, what about after that? What about deep space? Well, folks, pressurize your speculation suits or your warframes if you're lucky enough to be an operator, because there's a lot of ideas on how we get from here to the stars. Humanity's first step out into the black will start with those moon bases, as well as those on Mars. At first, those will be small scientific outposts. Think like the current research stations in Antarctica, made from modular habitats gradually brought with us or built with locally made construction materials like mooncrete. They might even use local soil to grow food. Though, to be fair, the Mars dirt is toxic, so there might need to be some treatment first. The overall goal being to learn how to sustain life on a foreign planet. However, life support is only one consideration. We also need a revolution in propulsion systems. Fuel currently takes up far too much weight on a spacecraft, and we also need engines that will get us from one world to another without everyone dying of old age. One technology already in use are solar sails, reflective materials that use the light of the sun to push a spacecraft forward. When light hits the reflective sail, the photons bounce off, transferring their momentum. And though each push is tiny, the steady bombardment of photons gradually accelerates the craft. And since in space there's no momentum loss due to gravity or friction, the vessel will just go faster and faster. Such craft maneuver by trimming or tacking the sail, much like a terrestrial sailboat. Currently, a small solar sail can fly as fast as a commercial jet, and if we pushed it with a laser, we could, theoretically, get a ship up to 20% of light speed. In 2010, the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency sent a solar sail-powered orbiter past Venus. And as this very episode was being written, the Planetary Society was testing controlled solar sailing in low Earth orbit. Though, to be fair, designing a sail big enough to propel a human spacecraft is still theoretical. But another option are ion thrusters, an idea that dates back to Salkowski and Goddard at the dawn of rocketry. These engines use electricity to ionize a neutral gas, creating an ion beam. And they're already a well-established propulsion system, with NASA developing the first in the 1950s and the Soviet Union launching hundreds of ion-driven satellites in the 1970s through the 1990s. But only now is the technology coming into its potential. NASA's Dawn space probe used ion thrusters to travel 2.8 billion miles in 2007, reaching the asteroid Vesta and the dwarf planet of Ceres. Dawn's three ion engines accelerated slowly, from 0 to 60 miles per hour in about four days. But, at the end of its mission, six years after launch, it was traveling over 25,000 miles per hour, and all of this on less than a thousand pounds of fuel. So with a few decades of development, that's the kind of tech that could get us beyond our own system. But what do we do once we're out there? Well, mine asteroids for one thing. Most metals, like gold, cobalt, nickel, and tungsten, actually arrived on Earth via asteroids. And we're, well, running out. Meaning, we have to get more from somewhere. Mining asteroids will also be a necessary step for deep space exploration, because at some point, we're going to be far enough away that resupplying from Earth will be impractical, and fuel will have to be manufactured by splitting water into liquid oxygen and hydrogen. But each of these are only small steps towards the science fiction dream, a technology that lets us truly bridge the gap between the stars. Will it be generation ships slowly gliding through space? Will it be some form of hibernation that lets crews sleep through thousand-year journeys? Or will we at last find some way to breach the ultimate barrier and pass the speed of light? Zaraman 10 do you read me? Zaraman 10 do you read me? Thanks, everyone, for watching this series and chronicling humanity's journey to the stars with us. And also a special thanks to Lotus herself for coming along for the ride. And for, you know, letting me squat in this orbiter for six weeks. It was my pleasure. I learned much of humanity's first reaches towards a higher understanding. And getting Zoe hooked on index runs was a nice bonus. Tenno rising! The market looks nervous! Uh, good times. 
Sadly though, Zoe and I do have to be getting back to Earth to continue conveying planetary history. But before I go, I still want to tell everyone how to enter the Become a Space Ninja sweepstakes. All you gotta do is register at the link below and then complete one successful Warframe mission each day from now until December 31st to increase your chances of winning $250,000 towards an actual space flight of your very own. Essentially making you part of the history of space travel yourself. Very well put, Matt. You know, I'll miss our little chats. So, I got you a parting gift. Aw, you didn't have to do that, Lotus. But since you did, what is it? 10,000 plat? Keys to a new railjack? Prime access to all the snacks in DE's break room? Even better. The fastest ride home. Fastest ride home? What are you? Uh, I appreciate the sentiment, Lotus. I've just never really been good at arcwing pilot. <laughs> Safe travels, my odd animated friend. Oh, that was awesome. Well played, Lotus. Well played. <laughs>